My guest today is the founder and managing principal of Mitigate Partners, a risk management, cost containment, and employee benefits consulting firm. He's a charter member of Health Rosetta's Certified Benefits Advisor Program. His all-too-rare interest in treating the employer's money like his own led him through years of research culminating in the development of his proprietary fair cost health plan with million dollar bottom line savings. Maybe yours too. Starting right now. Welcome to the show, Carl Schusler. Thanks for having me, Hunter. It's an honor to be on your show. I've, I've watched it and really, really enjoy it. Thank you so much. You're very kind. And, and I was going to say, what we have here is a, is a really powerful combination going on. We have direct primary care, and that's getting care right. And then the missing element in, in the shows that I've done, aside from Dr. Ken Fisher, who talked about HSAs, health savings accounts. It's getting benefit plans right, not necessarily fixing them because I think a lot of them are beyond fixing. I think they need a complete do-over and breaking the pieces apart and, and assembling them in a better way. So, and I, and I also think this is gonna be an important way of getting out of the economic mess that we're in. Uh, the trillions of dollars that we're spending, and there's a lot of money, there's a lot of health savings on the line here that we have sitting in front of us. So, Carl, change my mind. <laughs> change your mind? <laughs> no, I, I'm in to total agreement with you that I really believe with what we're doing, with what's just happened in our country across all gamuts, obviously COVID, uh, the biggest piece, is it really influenced and shown where the gaps are in healthcare and where the fallacies are in healthcare. So I think direct primary care is gonna be significant. And I think too, Hunter, we've struggled with employers where we'll show them saving millions of dollars and they don't pull the trigger and move forward with it. I think now we're getting close to that tipping point where they're gonna, their hands are gonna be forced to cut costs any way they can. And with our model and what we've done with our fair cost health plan, we've improved financial outcomes for the member and the employer while also improving clinical outcomes at the same time for the member. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'm not gonna, I won't argue with what you said. I think- I It, think it was a loaded exactly question. <laughs> I think you're exactly correct. This is the time to, to address it and it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. I love that attitude because I, I, I agree. It can be done. Now you mentioned fair cost health plan and that was one of the things when I, when I read about you and I went, what on earth is this? So Carl unpack that a little bit for me and for the audience, what are they, how, why and how did this happen? Hunter, we were just, I, I, I think the frustrations I shared were also amongst many other benefit advisors across the country, but it, it was probably seven years ago, and we started to look at the problems with the healthcare system, and we said there's six fundamental flaws in the healthcare system, and I'll call them out to you. Um, a lack of, uh, I call it the cartel, and that's the insurance companies pharma, um, hospitals, sometimes not often, because I have a special heart, a place in my heart for physicians, but, it, and then we are the last component. I was part of the cartel um, as a broker at that time in my career. I'm not a broker anymore, I'm an advisor. That's number one was the cartel. Number two was a lack of pricing transparency. Number three was medical billionaires. Number four was, um, was what we call the traditional PPO discount game. And number five was the pharmaceutical shell game. And lastly was the lack of information and data that an employer could gather. What we decided, Hunter, is that's kind of a negative message. So we would go out, these are six flaws in the system. Well, that's great. We turned them into, a, and I've done a lot of talks across the country on this, these six opportunities in healthcare. 
And by doing that and unbundling that, we started to look at all the cost containment, risk mitigation, risk mitigation, high performance healthcare solutions we could find across the world. And as we started vetting and understanding them, we started pulling pieces together and so forth. So as we looked at the system, we unbundled and deconstructed the whole system and rebuilt it brick by brick with these high performance healthcare solution partners. And I, I, the very bottom foundation is, is value-based direct primary care. So that's how it all kind of came about. The big challenge, Hunter, was this. We couldn't get it. And I, as you know, I'm, I'm pretty passionate, so I'm on, I'll, I'll try to calm down. We, no, I love it. <laughs> we, 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 we couldn't find a BUCA, you know, Blue Cross, United Signet, and Humana, a uh, cartel administrative service only self-funded model that could do this. It was passively managed. It, you couldn't control the cost. It was whatever solutions they had, which were usually to buoy their stock price. We were frustrated with that. Then we started talking to independent third party administrators, Hunter, and we were equally as frustrated. So they were doing stuff and they'd say, Carl, this is what we had that they've done. I said, wait a minute, this is what we're looking for. And you'll like this. I know you like analogies. So I would call them and I called, uh, you know, the original, the CEO guidebook, Dave Chase's first book. They had asked to use some of our third party question, uh, third party administrative questions. And unfortunately, as you picked up, I'm, I'm kind of long winded. So were the questions. So we they couldn't fit in the book. And I said, y'all edit it. And they go, oh, we don't have time. So it didn't get in the book. But I, I, I think I'm good at that in TPAs, but I've made a lot of mistakes. So I, I think that's, a, a, I'm not sure if I am, but we started looking and here was what we do. We call up, say, Hunter, this is Carl Schusler. Heard about you through so-and-so. We've got a health plan called the Fair Cost Health Plan. And we're, we're hosting a party. Um, excuse me. We're having a party and we want to see if you can host it. And here's what we've got so far. We've, we've locked down the catering. We've got the band. We've got the booze. Uh, we've got the a valet parking. We're ready to go. The problem is we got nobody to host our party. Can you host it? And they would say, well, Carl, you know, you can't serve Bud Light. You have to serve Michelob Light. I'm like, no, I want to serve Bud Light. So that analogy is all the components of our fair cost health plan. So when they wouldn't do what I wanted to because we believe what we've assembled is better than anything ever created. And I don't need a TPA to do that for me. That's my job. I'm a benefits advisor. They're not an advisor. They're a processor of claims. That's the first thing. So when we did this, we brought it together. We guys were on the fourth rendition and I think we finally found the best TPA and I'll, I'll share it in a second. And I'm known to say this quote, um, all TPA suck is finding the least sucky of the suckiest. And we have identified the least sucky of the suckiest. And that's become their tagline. And it's, uh, it's uh, I'll share with us, Aether TPA run by Laura Hurst and Lisa True. And they're wonderful. I didn't know it was possible to have a real partner in this game with us. And I did not know that it was possible. I feel like I work for them. I was telling my the hospital client of ours that you know about, I said, am I an employee of them or are they an employee of mine? I've never seen anything like it. They're unbelievable. So they are the glue, the gorilla glue that holds this thing together and it's working magnificently now. And that was the missing link for us. After four tries, we finally, it was three strikes and you're out. That doesn't, not, not the case for me. You keep trying. <laughs> yeah. So I think we finally got it. It's always worked well, Hunter, but we deploy what's called a benefits champion in our, in our programs that the employer employees or they could be housed with us. And they are on top of the claims funding requests as they come in weekly. They're watching everything. So that's how we found out how poorly these TPAs did things. And a lot of employers in America, Hunter, whether they're with a BUCA or an independent third-party administrator, they're paying these claims having no idea if they're right or not. I can give you numerous examples. One last thing. The other thing about the TPAs that often bothered me was, Hunter, if they brought a solution to the table for my client, they have a backroom deal with that, with that vendor where they get paid something off of it. Our model, the only money the TPA gets is the admin fee per employee per month 
because we brought the party to them, the Fair Cost Health Plan, that's a pass through directly to my client, a contract with my client, and that's what they pay. There is no money being made from anyone except the administrative fee. So if I put my CEO hat on, um, and, and most CEOs, are they look at healthcare plans and go, just give me something easy because I want to get back to what's really important to my company, and that's making widgets or providing a service. But now COVID-19 is basically busting a lot of things wide open, and I think they're going to be looking at the bottom line with some real tight and focus. And I think a lot of relationships uh, from, I see it in supply chains. I, I see it in a lot of things. People are reevaluating things. But if I'm a CEO and I've been going to maybe Augusta National for the masters and, and now I'm thinking yeah, to myself, born. wait, yeah. What? I was born in Augusta. You were or born in Augusta. Augusta. Well then. Disgusta. Disgusta as we call it. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Who's paying for these trips? Oh, hell, I am. <laughs> you know, in a roundabout way, I'm paying for these trips. Excuse me, hold on a minute. Um, I think I need to reevaluate my healthcare program. Uh, and, and from the little, well, I've done more than a little. Uh, I've watched some of the videos, and I'm going to include these in the links, uh, the links in the, in the description about what, uh, you've done and some some very good ones uh, with some of the partners you have. What I'd like to know is is a little more about some of some of the successes that you've had, and you, you have kind of a fear of the unknown for a lot of CEOs. They they really don't understand the game, and they're they're now going to be trying to figure this out but they don't like being first. There's the old saying, you never got fired by buying IBM. <laughs> um, well, not anymore. It, the game has changed. So, but I don't wanna be first. And the good news is there are businesses and governments that are saving money with this. I'm, I'm no longer gonna be the first. I'm not going to be the guinea pig. This is now established. It's going on. It's working with real world cost savings. In, in, in one case that I, I, I saw over a million, I think it was a million two the first year. 54%. Um, yes, sir. 157 employees. 150. Well, uh, there's nothing like success to, to capture a CEO's attention or, or a benefits manager for uh, a county. So expand a little bit about what these successes are and, and caught, I mean, CEOs love numbers, but it's also productivity. It's other things that go into it. Well, let's start with some of the numbers from counties and, and business. Okay. One of, uh, it's a great question, Hunter. It's a loaded question. I tell you, you're good at these loaded questions. And <laughs> You know, I, I'm a like Serve a lot, up. <laughs> I, I'm like a lot of people in our industry. I, I have ADHD, so I, I wasn't writing all that down. I'll do my best. Um, one of the things I failed to mention that's really, really important, Hunter, was, and I know we talked about passively managed health plans that most of these CEOs you're referencing that we're talking to, if you're the CEO, that's what they have. By deconstructing and rebuilding it and creating the fair cost health plan, this is an actively managed plan now. It's also what we call employer built healthcare, not insurer built healthcare. So, literally, it's building it brick by brick to the best outcome, the best solutions possible. So, the hospital, and I was DeSoto Memorial Hospital in Arcadia, Florida, fourth poorest county in the state of Florida, uh, per capita income of 25430 they lost obstetrics in February of 18. They're like every other rural hospital in America struggling. Um, we, by, we got introduced by as one of your favorites, direct primary care doctor, Dr. Lee Gross, who's wonderful and done so much. A hero. For, yeah, he has done so much for DPC across the country in the state of Florida. He brought us to the table and um, heard about what we were doing. And we worked together and integrated a program. Uh, 
we wrapped up our first year in September and we were three months hunter on a, and I, I, I won't reveal the, the carrier, but with a Buka TPA and then uh, uh, nine months on fair cost and three months on the Buka TPA, they spent almost $400,000 on that Buka TPA. And in seven months, when we looked at it on fair cost, the spend was almost identical for two and a half times more months. Wow. Okay. So the first year they saved 1.2 million or 54%. And I want to give, I, I think a lot of the credit, I think there's a lot of things we could sit and say, we're great, Hunter. That's why we're on your show. But I, I think Dr. Gross and Dr. Crouch and Ann Horner that runs their office, they deserve a ton of credit. That DPC is huge. And the other thing I think is interesting, this is a hospital, folks. <laughs> a hospital put in DPC and they own doctors. So I'm sure you, huh. I know you're probably going there at some point. But yeah, <laughs> they're, but, they're... but the point is, that was huge. Maybe we had a real good claims year too. I think it's a little of everything, but the bottom line is for the first time ever, they were able to really see, wow. And then when you talk about it, or you wanted me to say about actively managing a risk, month and a half ago, we had an employee that was at a, a cartel hospital, as I like to say, uh, on the Southwest Gulf Coast, not at DeSoto, but at a cartel hospital. They were uh, diagnosed, et cetera, had some issues, and they were being transferred to an LTAC, long-term acute care facility. We have a national contract through Fair Cost Health Plan with Kindred Health, which is the biggest LTAC organization in the country. We tried to get Kindred involved to get them to one of their LTAC facilities. That LTAC facility was too far away for that wife to drive to visit her husband. We were able to uh, work out a single case agreement with an LTAC not far away, um, at, uh, you know, a low, almost right around Medicare, which is unbelievable. And then when they stayed at the LTAC for a couple of days, they then were transferred to a rehab hospital, all hands on deck, our client and Lois Hilton that runs the benefit program called. We had our network development company. We had our TPA, the Aether gals. We had, um, our cost and quality company that helps line up doctors and facilities. Uh, everyone put their hands on deck. We got another single case agreement at 100% of Medicare. And that member was able to stay in their tier one benefits and their tier one benefits have no deductible. It was unbelievable. And that's the active management. I can tell you about a $1.8 million premature baby. I can tell you all these stories of what we do. And that's what we're talking about, active management, having the team work together. And again, for once now, we've always been able to do this, but now with the added partner that I didn't know existed with, with, with the Aether gals, that has really enhanced that. And the client, I mean, I get chill bumps talking about it. Just yesterday was like, Carl, this is unbelievable. Uh, the TPA, we put them with the first time. Again, Hunter, a, another mistake. Last year, this has been night and day. And night and day compared to the Buka, too. See, with the Buka, they didn't know what was going on because there was no active management. When we do what we call utilization management. When you call up and Hunter's going, Carl, I'm having a, a, a knee replacement. I have to have it pre-certed. You go through the pre-cert. Well, that pre-cert is critical. It's the traffic cop in our fair cost plan. That, tr that pre-cert catches that before it becomes a claim. That is substantial. So then we can get all hands on deck and start working with that member and getting them to the right care at the right time, at the, uh, at the right price, and most importantly, the right quality. So I don't I think I'm going off on tangents here, but that's what we, we can do. And that in itself is the separator. That in itself makes all the difference in the world when you can do that. And that member and everyone is so appreciative. And I mean, Hunter, seriously, I could take three hours. I have story after story after story. And um, the $1.8 million baby I can tell you about. But I do want to give you one utilization management story. One of our, we have a large school district in Central Florida. And uh, it's been an interesting thing. I don't know what I'm allowed or not to say on this show. But um, <laughs> um, the, the, the BUCA involved there 
We had about two months ago, Hunter, a $3.2 million heart transplant claim. Now, Hunter, the wow. first we heard of it was two months ago. You, you just don't go, hey, I'm getting heart transplant without having some advance notification. It settled and paid out around $2 million after the discount. Um, and that's the first we heard of it. Yeah. The stop loss is a million dollars. So that district absorbed a million dollars. On our platform, Hunter, if you were the one and you called or the provider called the mm -hmm. pre we would have been all over it. And I bet you we could have gotten it done for $300,000. And that's what I'm talking about. I don't mean to get so passionate. That's what's missing. These CEOs, when they find out about a claim after it's happened, we deal with it before it ever becomes a claim. We're not perfect, but we get a lot of them. Is that, that's, yeah. you know, so do I need to go? That's, that's a very good point in that a lot of, a lot of decision makers who are looking at, at healthcare now after COVID-19, because it's exposed so much. There are two things I'm going to put my, my CEO hat on again. Um, I hate it wanna, when you do that. <laughs> that's okay. I hear one of the terms that I hear and I've been hearing because I'm focused on this now is self-funded. And I cringe from a marketing standpoint. I know, I know the audience anytime and any enterprise here is wait a self-funded. What, <laughs> what do you mean self-funded? I mean, healthcare is really expensive and that's the critical point I think needs to be made is that healthcare is, artificially expensive. I won't get into why, you've already kind of explained a little of that. But getting back to self-funded, and can you unpack that briefly and, and, and reassure me that I'm not looking at a black hole because that's what I see. My perception is a black hole. I, I agree with you. Self-funded, partially self-funded, it's all this insurance jargon we run around and toss around. Um, and I want to make sure I'm clear. Are you asking me to say, Hunter, this is Mr. CEO. This is why you should consider this. Or are you asking me to do, uh, elaborate more? I just want to make sure I answer it correctly. Well, the folk put it another way and forgive me. That's, you know, me being trying to connect dots. No, I'm didn't. hearing, I'm hearing self-funded in my mind. I'm seeing a black financial hole that I don't need right now because I'm already staring at one and that is the recovery. And what are we doing in the future? So what does self-funded mean? I mean, how do I eliminate the black hole? How's that? Okay. Where I'm comfortable to maybe make that leap. Is that yeah. What you're yeah. Okay. I got it. I want to, I want you to get me to yes. <laughs> Gotcha. I'll do this. Hey, now you put me on the spot. I hadn't, I hadn't practiced in a while. I'll do my best. Um, I would say to you, because you're fully insured right now, right? You're buying your insurance from a kit. From an it's insurance easy. Insurance. It's easy. Yeah. yeah. It's easy. But what you've got, Hunter, is you already, the insurance company is kind of doing the self-funded for you. It's bundled. It's put together. In that behind the scenes, they have a stop loss policy they themselves buy on your group. They don't know how big it is. It's what we call a pooling point. So they're on the hook only this much money. And then they are using reinsurance companies to back them up if the claims go over it. So a lot of CEOs don't know that. So they're already kind of doing it, but the difference is they know that they only owe, you know, the cartel insurance carrier X amount of money per month. And that's a, they know and it's budgetable in there. And, and that's the black hole you're asking, what does that turn into? So when you go self-funded, you unbundle those pieces. And so you have what we call your fixed cost that you're gonna get billed for every month. That's your stop loss premiums. That's your TPA administrative fees. That's some of your fair cost health plan solutions that are in their fees. And then, uh, you know, we, the benefit advisor has to get paid sometime so our fees are in that component too. So that's every month, you know what that's going to be, Hunter. But what you don't know is what are the claims going to be? And the claims come in weekly and what we call a claims funding request. The difference is on our model, 
you're, we're going to help you fund to the worst case scenario and show it to you. But on our model, what we did, and this is a perfect example, back to the hospital, when we put the fair cost plan together and went to our stop loss partners, they saved the client from a BUCA TPA 58% or $150,000 on their stop loss premiums because of what they think of our fair cost health plan. That's what we're, so we lowered their fixed cost hunter, reducing their risk, and then all the programs we have in the fair cost health plan reduce their risk of ever hitting what that specific individual stop loss level. That now we have had it happen. I didn't think it could happen, but it did. And our hotel client had like three strokes in one year. I was asked to go down and do the benefit education meetings, and I said, "Hey, I'm not coming anywhere near that. I ain't drinking the water. I mean, it's not a good place to be." Um, but it did happen, and that's the first rate increase they've ever had in four years. So rate increases shouldn't happen. They they shouldn't, and we can get into that later. But um, in that example, we protect the client, you, Mr. CEO Hunter, from those bad risks happening. A perfect example, the heart transplant. It would have been a $300,000 claim. If your stop loss is a million, you would have never hit it. So we're minimizing the risk with our cost containment risk mitigation strategy. What do you say to those people that are looking at going from 20, 30 employees to it now into the big leagues where they, they've got to provide something. What are some of the things they can do now to prevent problems? Is there anything they should be avoiding? Um, kind of anticipating that, those issues, what should they not do? Um, that preventing problems. What, what, what do you think? Those that are that size, 30, 40 are in a, in a tough predicament. Um, it's hard. We've had groups self fund, you know, with what we just shared with you at that level, but it's hard. And I think the biggest thing, Hunter, they got to consider is what is their cash flow like? Um, it is a financial decision, is all it is. And if their cash flow is not good, Hunter, then they, I think, got to go to the insurance company and buy the insurance. If they want to do kind of a hybrid step, there's a program that is technically, in my opinion, and I think many others fully insured called level funded. So it's a hybrid as they say, but it's geared so heavily in the insurance company's favor, but it is a step and you can at least have access to your claims data and be able to see that. So that would be a hybrid for them to consider and then see how they run there on someone else's nickel and you fund to the max, worst case scenario. And if you do well, you get your profits back and the insurance company doesn't keep them. If you're fully insured, once the money's paid, it's gone, whether you had a claim or not. So the level funded offers a little return to you of, of instead of the insurance companies keeping the profits, you can get some money back. But it really all hinges on cash flow. If the cash flow is there, they can do this. Our strategies that we do and uh, uh, my other fellow mitigate partners around the country, those will, like I just show, shared examples with you, help control costs significantly. Um, so when you have that catastrophic claim or that cancer, things that can't be helped because you, mm -hmm. you had an Ironman triathlete that uh, got cancer. Obviously, they're in good shape. They got cancer. It happened. But then you have to have solutions and cost containment solutions there, which we have one of our building blocks to help. So it's cash flow. I think it boils to cash flow. So if you told me my cash flow is really good, Carl, then I would tell you we could explore this and look at it. Or maybe we do a crawl, raw, a, I can't speak well, a crawl, walk, run approach. Um, but if, I, if I'm a 40, if I'm a 40 employee business and I'm going to be 90, you know, in two months, I'm in a whole new world, aren't I? Yes. And you could let that risk be run or put it on someone else's shoulders before you take that leap to sell fund. So you might see what your claims do before so you jump. I need to know my options. And, let's, and Hunter, let's say this. I mean, you know, you get a hemophiliac, it's a million dollars a year in, in drugs, period. And we've got some solutions that require some travel and things, but that's what you've got to see. And if they don't know the risk of their group, they might want to do something in between. And then we can get a better idea of the risk we're doing. Like with the hotel, the Gasparilla Inn, 
when we met them, I got, we got hired a good Friday of, of 2015. And we looked and I talked to one of my mitigate partners, Barry Murphy. And I talked to him, I said, gosh, we need to go do this self-funding now. And I mean, it, it will work. And he goes, you got the increase down to 2%. And then we kept talking and that was Hunter when the Affordable Care Act was gonna require them to have their seasonals come back on and be immediately eligible. So we put that risk on the BUCA the first year to see what the risk looked like in those people. We still ended up for the fourth year in a row, they had a 65% loss ratio. <laughs> so BUCA was making a lot of money and they were popping their premiums each year, 15%. <laughs> so we were able to see that and then we flipped the switch. The fair cost in July 1st of 16 and then July of 17 made even further improvements as we improve it all the time as it's evolving at all times. It's never gonna be perfect, but we're striving for perfection. If we settle on excellence, we're okay. But that's, there, that's, yeah, thank you for that. I, I have another, it just popped into my head. Is there a big difference between, I know you've, I know you've helped out on, on, on local governments, counties. What about, um, is there a difference between the county and a, a county client or a city client and a, a business? Or is it basically the same? Is there anything significantly different? You're laughing. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's a story here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I'll answer that question. I, you've got... I'm gonna add an element to it. There's a school district, there's a municipality, and there's a private employer. Of all three of those, the school district is, is, is it's an opportunity to change the future of our youth in this country, to make a huge difference, to increase teacher salaries, to do all kinds of things, put more security in the schools. The opportunities are endless but it's a lot of work in that environment due to the bureaucracy that they operate in. Uh, many, many more meetings in a school district setting. A municipality has a lot less meetings, similar in some respects, taxpayer driven, et cetera, um, but similar, but not quite as intensive as a school district. And then the private employer is really simple to deal with because they make decisions uh, maybe they have to run it by board once a blue moon, but they make the decisions and they move and, and shake and go. Mm -hmm. um, that would be the biggest, I don't know if I'm answering your question fully, but it's so rewarding to me with a private employer because you've improved. Now that employee might be able to save for retirement. Yeah. Uh, if you watch that Gasparilla video, uh, Nate McKelvey, who's, who's one of their uh, re really strong employees they have there, he was interviewed and he says, what does this mean to me, all these improvements? Well, it means five to $10,000 less we pay that funds my kids' college or, or uh, we make two months house payments with it. That's what that means. Um, but it, to me, it's even more special in the public sector and a municipality because, you know, some of, I mean, and like a lot of America, sometimes wages are not as high as I know people would like them they've got wage freezes. We can increase the wages, the pay scales for all these people by saving all this money. And we can also reach out to the community, get the city, the county, the school, other employers together and build a community driven plan as you and I've talked about that we're doing for De in DeSoto County with DeSoto Memorial Hospital. We're in the middle of trying to. COVID derailed us a little bit, but we're in the middle of doing that. The school can also be a part of that, but I, I think that's the biggest difference that I would tell you. The school, because the way this functions in our country, it's just a little more burdensome and a little more bureaucratic, but my gosh, Hunter, I mean, I, I, um, we're so mission driven and I've been accused, my buddy goes, sounds like you're a politician, Carl, um, which I'm not, I just speak my heart and the chances in this particular case we're working on, school district, we could bring, if it works out, to where we get the average cost per employee per year to where our fair cost plan costs are, over a, over a 20 year period, a kindergartner through 12th grade 
And I know Dave Chase did a great study between Allegheny County Schools and, and, um, and uh, Philadelphia Schools in, his, in the CEO guidebook. It could be $345 million, Hunter, back to that community that's being extracted right now. Three hundred four, Hunter, what could you do with $345 million? And that gets my juices. I get chill bumps. That's what this is about. We could change the face of education forever. I mean, we could with this. So that, to me, uh, I love the rural hospital because we need those. Guys, people move to communities for three reasons, jobs, education, and health care. When health care dries up, the town dries up. We've got to save those things. That, that, that's something to mitigate. We love that mission. The school district's tough. You get a little more bald. You get a little fatter. Uh, you get a little more tired, a few more bags on the eyes like I am. So I don't know how much more I can take, but uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I know, the, uh, trust me, we, we show, we show movies up here on my forehead on the weekends, but, 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 but the bottom line is it is so awesome. And what could happen? Municipalities, again, the same private employers, all of them, but I, I, I mean, it just all depends on what charges your battery, but it is a lot of work, Connor, in the public sector. It's more work. It's more red tape than I think everyone knows this. I mean, that's what, what, what does government do that's is. easy? Yeah. But the, it's the, very rewarding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, what were the hot buttons for, the, for the, both the, the government and the private businesses? Were, were, were there anything? Did they hear something, see something that you saw the lights go on and they went, ah? Now I'm getting it. it. May not be a total yes. Let's do this. But what were some of the highlights, if you will, that made them go, "Okay, yeah, I need to pay attention to this." What were some of those things that they heard or saw that moved the conversation a lot faster? If there were anything, maybe it's maybe the process. They have to go through the process. Uh, a longer process? I don't know, but that's the question. What were some of those things, if any, that made them go, aha? I don't know. Believe it or not, I can answer that in maybe five or ten words, different than the rest of these answers. <laughs> Man, you're doing, words. you were doing this, and I said it, and I went like that, and they all just said, okay, that was it. So, okay, what's your next question? <laughs> <You're d> <laughs> now, um, no, uh, in all seriousness, and I want to, one of our Mitigate partners up in North Carolina, Christy Gupton, had, has said this quote, and, and it ties into this. All it takes is a good advisor and a little courage. And the courage is the employer, the courageous employer. And where we sit here and we think we're great, we got this great health plan, they deserve the credit. They're the courageous employer that took the step. They're the ones that stepped out of the status quo to do this. And I know you're asking, what, what do you think was the thing? What, what, where, the, where the light go off? <clears throat> but I want to make that clear. It takes a courageous employer. And you've got to help them feel they can be courageous and protect them from being courageous and not leave them out, you know, flapping in the wind with a bad, uh, 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 not a successful story man. I will tell you that I think, and, and I want to thank all of our clients that the videos were created. They deserve the credit. We're with them and we're partnering, but they deserve the credit. So I want to be very clear on that. Um, I would say this, most of the time, Hunter, it's been the pain is great enough. Now we got to change. COVID-19 has got many people to that point. Obviously, these were pre-COVID-19. That's the school district. They're in tough shape financially. This should be the first year they will operate without a deficit on their health plan. Now, we haven't done everything we want to do yet. We haven't got, hadn't fair costed it and everything yet else yet, but we've done a few things with some solutions you know about. Green Imaging, tremendous partner, Dr. Kristen Dickerson in Houston, saved uh, we're projected to save 1.3 million on imaging costs, which is that's a lot of increased teacher salaries. Um, they're 67th in most categories in the state of Florida. Wow. The, the, the pain is there. We got to change. We can't keep going. You yes. have to educate the client because if the pain's not great enough, Hunter, before COVID-19, people were blowing and going fat, dumb, and happy. And then, Hey, Carl, 
I believe we could save, and you're talking about making increasing my EBITDA by two times by saving this money. We operate on a 5% profit margin, and this goes right to our bottom line. Financially, this is great, but hey, Hunter and all my key employees are happy. We don't want to do that right now. They're changing their tune right now. So yeah. I don't think there's ever been a greater time to be a benefits advisor. I, I agree. Dave Chase wrote a great article years ago. I think the benefit advisor is one of the most critical jobs in America right now to help fix this healthcare system. And it's a, a it's upon us. And one of the things that I say that mitigate partners and I, I don't know what verbatim, I'm going to read it to you. Mitigate partners are committed to pushing our clients out of their comfort zone to bring different solutions, to deliver different results, and not to accept the status quo, even if it's what that client knowingly or unknowingly is asking for. Um, we relentlessly pursue both personally and professionally uh, opportunities to share, collaborate, learn, and how to constantly improve the situation of our clients and their employees. And that's what we do. And we advise different. Hunter. A lot of people will tell you, I've had numerous people say, Carl, this fair cost health plan is unbelievable. Why don't you just put one solution a year in for your client and you can keep them forever. And I'm going, well, let me ask you something, Hunter. If you knew you could save $5 million today versus a million, wouldn't you want to know about that? And the fear is we're going to lose the sale because we might confuse them. But you got to show people what the promised land looks like. And if they don't want to go there, you can walk them back. But I want to know if I can save five million, don't you? And I don't know who made the benefits advisor guide to decide to make those decisions, but that's what an advisor is supposed to do. And that's the difference between an advisor and a broker. You're with brokers, you're pushing a rope. With advisors, I tell everyone, if anybody's seen the great outdoors movie with John Candy, God bless his soul, and Dan Aykroyd, if you remember when he was on that boat, uh, you know, that uh, Dan Aykroyd, I think his name was is it Raymond in there? He got that fancy jet boat and, and John Candy was behind it and it looked like he knew what he was doing and he, all of a sudden he's barefoot skin going over ramps and all over. So when I tell you, when, when you work with a mitigate partner, you better grab them on for dear life because we're going to jerk you all over the lake versus you, you know, pushing the rope to get the boat moving. And that's the difference. So mitigate partners, you, you, you're the founder of it. I'm a co-founder co with, with, my, with uh, Barry Murphy and also Barry Broom. And you also, I'm going to have a link to it, obviously, but you have, you have, uh, and I may put it up on the screen. There's a, there's a map of where you all are. Um, yes. You've grown this over the years. When did you start that? Really, it, 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 it probably got active a year, year and a half ago, I would say. And really what it is, just to be clear, these are all independent business owners, these mm -hmm. benefit advisors. No one, uh, we don't own anybody but we come together to share and collaborate. Like the Health Rosetta is, it's just a more formalized group of some people that have met, gotten along, and are just helping each other, just like the Health Rosetta does. Um, and they're given access to some of our intellectual property and the Fair Cost Health Plan. And so um, it's a pretty loose license agreement, if you will. But um, it's about a year and a half, and there's now, we just added somebody on the panhandle. So we got about 20 offices. Um, and most of these people, if we're, we're not all working together, they're doing whatever they do and, and having successes on their own. And I, I wanted to help mentor people to give back to, because Barry Murphy, who, again, who started this with me, was my mentor out of, out of college. And as I, as he says now, and he's Barry's right at about 70, he said, now Carl's mentoring me, um, you know, the <laughs> child becomes the parent. Um, but um, as we went down this journey, Hunter, there's a real simple statement, and I, and I, I, I didn't say it at our first annual Mitigate Partner Summit back on June 9th at, at, at Gas Grill Inn. Smart people learn from their mistake, mistakes. Wise people learn from the mistakes of others. People need to be wise. Don't go out and do what we did for seven years. Uh, take it and use it and make it better but learn. And that's what this is about. It's about helping each other. And the other part is from all the, we've been very blessed and asked to speak a lot. Um, and we, we don't, we don't have a PR firm. We don't advertise. We've just been very blessed. And I don't know why these people keep asking. It's like this podcast. You're like, man, I made a big mistake bringing this, this, this blowhole on the, on the podcast, but not at all. The, yeah. Um, but, but these, um, there's opportunities that have come up. Um, we spoke at the ortho forum 
we had 15 or so orthopedic practices that want to talk to us. We were talking to them about our talk was twofold, how to, how to direct contract and then how to make your own benefit plan better. So it was twofold mm -hmm. and there are opportunities in these markets. So the local management part of mitigate partners. So Hunter Schultz is in Panama and there's a, a prospect in Panama. Hunter will be the local management because he's the local boots on the ground. And we'll co-advise, work together, and help. So that's really, really, it was a give back and to mentor and help people because we could do a lot of these cases ourselves, Hunter, but I don't want to do that. I want to help grow it, replicate, and get people, unclip their wings where they can fly off and do it all themselves because that's what I think this, this is about. And that's how we're going to change healthcare. If we try to hoard it and keep it all to ourselves, we can't do anything. So I think it's a collaborative effort. And Dave Chase, the Health Rosetta, gets a ton of credit for the things they've done and has yes. kind of created this open venue. And again, in an industry that was competitive as heck, never was collaborative. I think one of the most important aspects of what we've talked about today is, again, the fact that this is being done. One of my favorite sayings my dad's my dad used in in his talks and that was man who say it cannot be done should not interrupt man doing it and he attributed it he attributed that to confucius and it's sort of like when i started this show it was ready fire aim i really didn't know where i was going but uh it's evolved now into dpc sherpas which i hadn't even thought of back then in november when i started but I'm, I'm thinking that what you've done is essentially like Sir Edmund Hillary. He climbed Mount Everest with his Sherpa uh, and made it to the top. And all the climbers, everyone in the world went, wow, that's amazing. Because most people looked and went, oof, that's rough <laughs> before him. But I think the second ascent was even more important because it proved it could be replicated. And you're doing something really unique. You've sort of like, you're Sir Edmund Hillary. And then you went, by God, let's do it again. <laughs> so you proved it could be done. It's replicable and that's so important. So I, I, my, my uh, sincere thanks for doing that. And I know you had help and I know you had, uh, it's your team, if you will. And Dave Chase and a lot of others have been in, involved in this. So there's a group of you that went up the mountain and then you went right back up again after coming back down and said, yeah, we can do this. It's not a one-time thing. This isn't just a, you know, a, it isn't lucky. It's just preparation and hard work and you did it. And, and I commend you for that and your team and Thank you. good job. Thank you. Carl Schussler of Mitigate Partners. It has been a real pleasure. And I learned so much today, and I know, I know everyone who viewed uh, uh, did as well. Thanks. Well, and Hunter, I want to thank you. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I'm sorry I was so monotone and not lively today. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any coffee, and I don't drink coffee, by the way. But um, I do want to thank all the Fair Cost Health Plan partners that have really been unbelievable and when we had our summit last two weeks ago I had to turn away a lot of people that wanted to come it was like 30 of them that wanted to come and we had nine because of COVID I said look we're only gonna have nine mitigators there I don't want you to waste your time and travel and potentially get sick and um, it means a lot they've been there and and uh, I would you know for lack of a better term I'd go to the cross for them and I think they do that for me we're partners uh, we rise and fall together, and I also want to thank the Mitigate partners and all the people around the country, Dave Chase, all the rest, everybody that's trying to do something. There have been some great, David Contorno has been a huge, you know, he's been out there in the forefront. There's so many people, I'm leaving tons of names off, but um, we, we, if we want to go fast, go alone. We want to go far, go together, the old African proverb. So I think that's what that's about. And it's great people like you who have these shows. And um, Thank you. You know, I'm just blessed. I'm very thankful and appreciate all the folks. And I want to 
and I'm, 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 what am I doing here? I want to also thank my family because they've had to put up with a lot. I mean, I, I have cauliflower here every day. There's something growing out of my ear every day and it's constant. So it's called a telephone. And uh, so it's, it's a lot of work, but I want to thank my family and their support, my wife, Missy and all that. And, um, but it's, it's, it's an honor to be on your show. I hope that this has given people hope because I believe this is absolutely replicable and achievable. Absolutely. Oh, terrific job. I'm Hunter Schultz for Winning Healthcare Food Fights. Thanks for joining us today and stay healthy, wash your hands a lot, and there you are. Thank you.